गुड इवनिंग डॉक्टर जयराम गुड इवनिंग डॉक्टर देश पांडे गुड इवनिंग आई एम डॉक्टर महेश कांत फ्रॉम जीसीसीएमसी ग्रुप ओके एंड आई एम लुकिंग आफ्टर द हॉस्पिटल एट ऑफ विप्रो फॉर कोविड इन पुणे ओके Dr Vijay and Dr Krishna should be joining in also shortly. Sure. And uh, Ms Shobha I think has yet to join? Yeah. Yeah. You all? I am Dr Mahesh Khan. I am at Pune. I am looking after the COVID hospital for Bipro. We and then we formed this GCCMC along with the uh, Bipro. and basically it is started from october last year and this platform was created for doctors to communicate ideas and uh, you know learn from each other and then over a period of time it has evolved now we are going more into the public and that's how it's gone into youtube and etc right so we go on till 7 o'clock right yes that is the structure dr krishna would have explained i think or dr vijay uh, was... yeah i kind of put up a uh, dr krishna is here i did yeah, put dr. up an agenda on the group so that uh, accounts for until 7 o'clock hi dr krishna hi 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 neeta hi Usha. hi krishna uh, All my favorite people are in this particular. Oh. <laughs> and hi to Dr. Vasanta. I am seeing her after such a such Dr. a long Krishna. time. I am I in that the favorite or is there some gender discrimination? It is only about women. If you have a sex change, <laughs> or you woke enough to be gender fluid? <laughs> no, you are. I I meant everybody who is playing, and Shobha will join is also a wonderful person that I know. So it's been a long time. Doctor Vasantha used to take care of so many of our patients, and then yes. <laughs> so Neeta uh, Usha is my colleague from uh, SRMC. She is okay. a professor of obstetrics. Doctor Vasantha was the was in psychiatry in SRMC. She is now at Global. Dr. Mahesh Kant runs the Pune Hospital uh, that uh, Vipro has created. So she, Dr. Poo, Dr. Uh, Neeta Mahesh, uh, pretty close to each other in distance, but also Neeta travels to Pune a lot. Uh, yes, I do. She supports half the economy of Pune, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever that means. <laughs> no, any time. No, but Usha is almost like that, you know. You know. Uh, between the two of them, I know that they can carry two two economies on their shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> I, Doctor Krishna, and I have traveled together too much, so I have, my lips are sealed. He kind of knows everything. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I, but you know, I I I have never strategically used it. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so we've done so 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 actually you know today uh, even the norwegian economy the swedish economy have have at some point of time benefited from neeta <laughs> <laughs> do, do we need to message shobha or what i am and i just i just text shobha we don't know how many people are going to come in directly but they will also be in the uh, youtube We are also competing with the Indo-Pakistan match today. Yes. Ah. Everybody is yes, watching. Yes. <laughs> oh goodness. <laughs> no, what but that will start uh, after this. But it's starting. Yes. 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 No, this is like you know. Uh, 
I don't know. Uh, so uh, in the US, there is this uh, major league fo- football. So right, and 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 the ga- game will start at six o'clock, and the and the build-up starts around noon. <laughs> and and you know, people have different kinds of food made. That, uh, uh, the beer is brewed. It is everything is done towards it, and all major companies will do their first half in the in the Super Bowl. We will we will start on time. You know, anyway, this is recorded. It is also the hits are very very high. Uh, people like the program, and we had very very good feedbacks for this. Okay. So we're hoping to continue this till December. The 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 COVID thing. But just for you, all of you, to know that this platform is is going to be available mostly uh, for any 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 group or event who wants to use for a healthcare purpose. You want to reach out to patients. You want to you want to conduct your professional society meetings without paying uh, paying a money to the uh, events manager or pharma. You can use this platform. It's available. It's free. It's uh, it also has uh, the GCM platform is very nice. It's available. Just just ping one of us. They will release it. You don't have to you know run after pharma for sponsorship. Yeah. Or these kind now, of very frequently that becomes a problem. You know, if you want to do a patient care thing, or you want to do classes, mm. I've needed a course on this. So, if you want to put up a put up a course on it, use it. Okay. So Vijay is moving to a new house today, so he won't join Mahesh. So you can. Will you will you be able to do a vote of thanks? Yeah, yeah, okay. fine. But he. डॉक्टर वसंता आई थिंक यू हैव ट्राइड टू स्पीक वॉज इट ऑन म्यूट because we didn't hear you i could only hear your lip movements uh even now i think yeah we can't hear you no Can log out and log back in i think uh that... vasanta we can't hear you uh maybe she needs your phones Uh, Dr. Basanta, can you log out and log back? That is the safest way to do this. No, one second. You're you're muted. That's all. Just unmute. Un- uh-huh. un- so even when she was on unmute, she was not heard. Can you speak now? No, you have to log out and log back. Hi, uh, hi, Shobha. Hi, Krishna. Hi, Shobha. I want you to meet some uh, uh, people here, uh, and and you've joined their list of my being my favorite people. So, <laughs> Kim Shunath is uh, is a colleague of mine for many many years and a friend. She uh, are you already head of the department? Uh, she heads. Uh, she's a professor of obstetrics and gynecology at Ram Chandra. Neeta. uh is basically the person that who i attach to when we travel so that you know she can she can whenever whenever we need to uh lessen and help a country's economy we take neeta with us so so but neeta neeta is from belgaum uh in fact uh, you'll see signs of uh, you know when you approach belgaum you'll see arches in her honor <laughs> <laughs> oh my god this is too much <laughs> she she runs a big diabetes center there more importantly is her interest in 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 weight loss and 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 reversal usha has done a lot of work over the years working with nurses and helping quality and uh, that's a big big thing and besides being all the other things that usha has we just lost dr basanta she will join back and she is a psychiatrist who has a special interest in women's health very very good the person uh, the other bald head in this picture is mahesh <laughs> mahesh runs the uh, hospital that vipro created for covid in pune he pretty much you know is is really the 
the workhorse of the work, all the stuff that we do, very level-headed. He's single-handedly done so much of the work for COVID that uh, Vipro has done. So that is, we are one minute away. Uh, so very flattering. Huh? Very flattering. <laughs> no, not. <laughs> the, it, it gets you everywhere, you know. But that, <clears throat> that's a good stance to take. I've decided when I introduce a panel, I am going to be gregarious and uh, make them feel good. Absolutely. But, 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 you know, all the things that I said were from my heart. So, so there you go. Right. So one more minute. Yeah, I'm here. I'm just going to reach for my water. I'll be right back. Can you get me a coffee? it up. So, Neeta, the final uh, uh, program that the RSSTA sent had nothing to do with what we did. See, I really didn't take it that seriously, Dr. Krishna, because uh, this often happens in these big meetings because all other considerations other than academics come into play. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you may draft the best scientific program in the world, but, you know, it kind of, get, kind of gets shot down. But you know what? One of these days, huh. think about it. We uh, do you see that concept that I brought in about the metabolic switches and uh, things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. We should we should think about you know do one more of these jugal bandis where where we spend a more more time on you know right. the basic science and the clinical implication. Yeah, and and now there is a lot of uh, uh, I mean, there's a drug that has come for metabolic flexibility and stuff like that. So. Uh, it's good to revisit this particular physiology. Right. No, in fact, that's why I put it up in that particular talk. Yeah, yeah. It, it was, was fun good. for me to look at it. It was very nice. It was a good webinar. It was fun. It was really nice. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're all set. Uh, let me introduce... Uh, is, can, we, oh, Dr. Vasanta is here. Yeah. Dr. Vasanta, can you speak? I think she's still connecting. Yeah, there she is. Can you speak, Dr. Vasanta? It's still connected. Yeah. Can you speak? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. We have all, all six on board. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to this uh, panel. As usual, we are, uh, you, can, you can time uh, your watches to the time we start. Uh, just to introduce uh, what we have done uh, over the past two years, uh, we the GCCMC is a platform that was created by Vipro uh, to provide support to doctors during the endemic. That is how it started. And initially, we started doing webinars for doctors. We did a course on uh, COVID-19 along with the PHFI that they gave a certificate program for people to learn how to understand and treat COVID. Then we started doing, we initially started aggregating data and putting up evidence-based uh, guidelines. And then we realized that the evidence was more emotion than evidence. So that we abandoned. Uh, uh, in fact, the one thing we've learned in COVID is that evidence-based medicine is dead, long live emotion-based medicine. And, and uh, then what we did was we spent a lot more time uh, working on uh, these webinars. We also started supporting programs that were done at local levels to to, to increase the awareness of COVID and, and reducing practices. Simultaneously, uh, there, there, was a, there was a COVID hospital that was built in out of scratch from, uh, in, in Pune uh, with, with, with tremendous uh, support of the Zilla Parishad and, and, and served the rural uh, suburbs of Pune uh, and now it's one and a half years. We now have the data that is ready to, to, to get published and you know, that that's the big. Then somewhere we realized that the big news is vaccines, and then and then of course the public. So we started doing some offbeat programs, starting with the economy and how it has been affected by COVID. How can doctors recover economically from COVID? Many doctors were very you know losing practices, shutting it down. So we did those kind of programs. Then uh, we looked at vaccine hesitancy. Uh, last time we had a program with Dr. Rangarajan, the former uh, chief economist for the country, again addressing the economy. 
So as we wind down the COVID and we're going back to school, we're doing two things. Uh, one, uh, women and COVID. Uh, if, uh, what has happened is, it's not just work from home. It's just that when work from home happens, women work more. So I've had complaints about, uh, with women saying, you know, I'm always in the kitchen. I'm, I'm downloading YouTube uh, recipes all the time. My children are hungry all the time. When will they go back to school? This is one bit. Then the financial impact of all of this, but also the psychosocial impact that has occurred. If, if, if my, my experience is limited, but one of the things that I have noticed is the amount of anxiety that, that seems to be the new epidemic in this pandemic. And, I, and, and that seems to have affected women in particular. So we decided we'd get some experts on this. Uh, the women themselves who have, who have seen this at their own homes, but have also helped other people cope with the disease. So to lead this panel, uh, I have Dr. Neeta Deshpande, one of the country's foremost diabetologists, a specialist in nutrition and, and bariatric medicine. She, she brings a lot of insightfulness and practicality in her discussions and, and, and brings a lot of passion into any program she does. So Neeta will, will introduce our, our, our star panel today. And I can tell you why we are competing with the, uh, the prenuptials of the India-Pakistan match. I can tell you that this is a better place to be. Thank you, uh, Neeta, all yours. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Krishna. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with this very eclectic panel uh, to discuss a very important issue. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has not been very kind in many ways. And as you all know, women don many hats. And that's why they bear the brunt of such a disaster and such a situation. So let's uh, meet with our experts to see uh, how women have been impacted, especially so in this pandemic and what lessons we have learned and going forward, what we should be doing. And for this, we have three very, very accomplished personalities with us. Let me introduce them to you one by one. We have with us Ms. Shobha Narayan, who is the author of five books, She's been a journalist and columnist for over 30 years, writing about health, relationships, travel, food, and culture for global publications, winning a James Beard Award and Pulitzer Fellowship. She has taught and lectured at universities in India and abroad. She is the host and anchor of Bird Podcast, which is about birds and nature. She is the overseas correspondent for Radio New Zealand. And I love her lifelong mission. And that's fantastic. And I wish everyone could have this mission. And her lifelong mission is to get fit without exercising and lose weight without dieting. I wish we get the holy grail for that sometime soon. And that would be wonderful. And the second person that we have with us today is Dr. Usha Vishwanath, who is uh, an obstetrician and gynecologist from Chennai. She's been with the Sri Ramachandra Medical College and Research Institution right since 1995 and now heads the department. She's the professor and head of that department. She's won the national award for Suraksh Intrapartum Monitoring Mobile App at the Kahotech 2021. She is an NABH assessor for full and entry level accreditation and has authored a textbook on obstetrics for undergraduates and postgraduates. She is the chairperson for hospital quality assurance division at Sri Ramachandra Hospital. And she's also designed the mobile app Suraksh for intrapartum monitoring of patients. She completed her training in tubal microsurgery at Chennai. She's the secretary for the UNESCO bioethics program of is SRIHER. Uh, she's been awarded the Diploma in Hospital Administration by the National Institute of Health and Family Welfare, New Delhi. She is the coordinator for the EDCOM program for MBBS students and the secretary for Sri Ramachandra Center for Women's Advancement and instructor of advanced life support in the obstetrics program. So welcome, Dr. Usha. Thank and you. yeah, and now we have uh, a very, very experienced psychiatrist on board, Dr. Vasanta Jairam, also from Chennai. She also worked initially in the Ramachandra Medical College and later at the Karpaga Vinayaga Medical College. And she's been a, 
a private practitioner in the field of psychiatry for the last 35 years and was also earlier associated with IIT Hospital, Sundaram Medical Foundation and Global Hospital. She's currently associated with Apollo OMR and private clinic at Tiruvan Mayur, Chennai. Her areas of interest include liaison psychiatry, women and mental health, and she's associated with community programs and lectures on stress management in colleges and corporates. So as you can see, we have a very, very well accomplished and uh, very able panel here today to discuss about uh, women and the pandemic that we've just been through. So my first question is uh, to Ms. Shobha Narayan. As a journalist and columnist, your observation powers would obviously be unique. You would see things that others don't. So in general, would you say that the lockdown period has opened the eyes of society in general and men in particular uh, about the multitasking capacity of women? Mm. Uh, thank you, Dr. Neeta, for including me in your panel. And uh, I think that's a terrific first question because all of us women have been asked that. Has the lockdown finally made you, uh, made society understand what all women go through? And it is usually stated as a compliment. I want to answer that with a story which happened in my Bangalore uh, housing complex, which like many of us is a high rise and it's a fairly privileged society. And during the worst part of the lockdown, the, uh, when no household help was allowed to come in, a uh, committee that I'm part of for the building um, received a request from a gentleman here. Um, the only exceptions for the household help to come in were the elderly who required nursing care or uh, uh, help. So this gentleman wrote to us and said, you know, I'm a single man, I'm a bachelor. I would request that my cook be allowed to cook for me. And uh, it is a normal request and it's also a strange request because there are, we have uh, single mothers in our building with young children. And what was interesting to me when I look back is that how normal we thought it was and all of us women were like, yeah, yeah, we should help him. We should get the cook to help him. And it was a man who called us out and said, listen, he's a grown man. For 15 days, he can cook for himself. He should learn how to do it. So uh, women are foisted in a way we are complimented at being multitaskers we are we are said that we are very good at it um, and I think that a harder and a more necessary stance at this stage might be the opposite because I think yes yeah. women can multitask but also men can multitask yeah. and thanks to being homebound some of our husbands and some of our sons discovered that they liked being in the kitchen with all the without all the help hanging around they may have liked to cook for themselves some of the fathers amongst us may have discovered the joys of help, helping their young ones with homework and having the children actually say i want daddy to do it or um, appa to do it instead of only relying on amma um, so all the things that men ceded, the power that they ceded in the house to their wives, to their the spouses, they were able to regain through the lockdown. So in a way, your very important question, which is, can women multitask? Yes, we can. We have done it. Some of us, you, you know what, we do it so naturally and so easily that we don't realize we have been forced to do it forced. as a caregiver and enabler. So it puts a disproportionate pressure on women. And lastly, I would say like, unlike in companies, unlike at hospitals where certain areas have specialized roles at, in a house, we need the flexibility, we need fluidity, agility from all partners. So the pandemic should teach us that rather than celebrating women for being multitaskers, we should also celebrate men and encourage them to be multitaskers at home. So, right. yeah, very well said. As you said, uh, the, the, the crown of being a multitasker is not always a welcome one. And uh, it's not something that we've probably asked for, but been forced to wear. So very well said. So uh, th th that was a very nice way of telling us through that story. Uh, my next question is to uh, Dr. Vasanta. 
Uh, Dr. Vasanta, we've all read about this, that there has been a lot of anxiety, depression, mental issues, etc. Uh, have you seen a spike in all of that? That is my first question. And the other corollary to that is that uh, women, because of being multitaskers, may be going through these issues but never express it, but it could be detrimental to their mental health. So uh, is there a way for the other persons in the family to recognize uh, that this particular woman is not doing well and has mental health issues? Yes. Uh, first at the outset, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak. And thank you, Dr. Deshpande, for giving me such a wonderful uh, introduction. Good evening, good evening, everybody. Now, if you look at women as such, women, uh, as far as mental health is concerned, women have a greater vulnerability for emotional problems. The emotional problems are twice as high as in the men, you know, in the case of women. So they are emotionally vulnerable, all right? So definitely any calamity, it's not just a pandemic, even if it, when it was uh, Hurricane Catherine or it was an earthquake, the brunt, major brunt is always felt by the women, even during the tsunami, okay? So the pandemic was no different, but of course the pandemic had its own characteristics, which were different from other calamities. Now, what we saw was problems faced by women across the spectrum, okay? And we had a lot of people coming in with anxiety, fear, because of the uncertainty of the pandemic, fear that they would get infected or fear about infection, the cost it entails, and unfortunately, the media was also highlighting the negative aspects of the pandemic, okay? And that access to information, I wouldn't call it knowledge, information, all kinds of information about the pandemic. So all this caused anxiety, and anxiety symptoms are worry about the future, worrying about health, unsure about what to do, confused. Some of them became very obsessive, fear of contaminating, so they would keep on washing the vegetables, things like that. Then fear of going out, even if it necessitated. Some of them delayed even uh, seeking medical help. You know, they delayed even something when they had like as serious as chest pain and heart attack. Some of them became very depressed because of the old loneliness. And as women, we like to talk, we like to be socially active, at least within our group. That was lost. And uh, more so when you were contained in one place and you're uh, saddled with a lot of responsibilities at home, you had no free time at all. And when there was no help uh, forthcoming, definitely it drove several women towards depression. People with depression came with feelings of guilt, feelings of inadequacy, unable to cope, unable to show interest in their work or household chores, some of them becoming irritable and things like that. Now, if you look at the types of problems that uh, we got with respect to COVID, one was the COVID patients itself developing depression, insomnia, which was seen more in women, all right. Then, we, and after recovering from COVID, they had this post-traumatic stress disorder because they saw people gasping for breath. You know, and one thing about breathing problems, unlike other uh, physical symptoms, when you have a breathing problem, you feel as though you're drowning. So even if the breathing problem is not a severe one, like in asthma, the patient's distress level is very high. Okay. So when they see others fighting for breath and somebody suddenly becoming serious, so many of them, even after they recovered from COVID, they had post-traumatic stress disorder. They're having flashbacks of that uh, scene running through their mind. This is for the COVID patients. Then you had another group in the general population who had caregiver stress. They were taking the entire burden of the family because men got affected more, husbands got affected more. They had to take the entire uh, caregiving uh, burden of the family. Then you had another set of people called, which fell in the group, uh, worried well syndrome. They're all okay. They were healthy. But constantly they were monitoring their uh, heartbeat or their risk to or their breathing, they were obsessed with them breathing. They were body monitoring all the time. And uh, they were even wanting to get checked for COVID. You know, so we call them as worried well syndrome. Usually uh, we do get doctors coming for stress, but during the COVID, there were many more healthcare professionals uh, seeking help for stress. We already have doctors working in ICU, cancer, working in areas where the stress levels are likely to be high. But during the pandemic, we had a greater uh, preponderance of doctors seeking help 
and uh, certainly more women doctors because they they felt they felt uh, very helpless when they found the patient uh, going through the last stages of covid infection and were not sure of what is going to happen to him and they had these prolonged hours of work and in addition to that they were also worried about their families so the dual responsibility for women especially working in the healthcare se- sector was very difficult and they could not ask for leave or less hours of working because organization would drive guilt into them you are a doctor you have got to work you are a healthcare provider you have to work so i think these were the factors which also contributed to greater mental distress during the covid pandemic right so battling mental health issues can be a real challenge especially when there is lockdown and restricted access to counseling so uh, the same goes true i think for physical disorders also and one thing that comes to my mind uh, dr usha is pregnancy uh, we've all heard of stories you know where uh, women were pregnant and they couldn't get to the hospital in time and had to deliver somewhere halfway and they were not getting the antenatal care and in general were Uh, kind of uh, neglected during uh, this uh, lockdown and the pandemic what has been your experience especially with respect to the pregnant women in uh, during this time uh, i think i need to start with the first wave and then move on to the second wave yeah. because when the first wave came uh, i i still remember that it was a big huge acid test for my leadership planning organizing handling an entire team and it's a department that can never sleep so i i saw every department drawing down their shutters and uh, we were the only ones like we had to keep on and on so in the first wave we found that all the nearby nursing homes small hospitals everybody closed down and they weren't giving any kind of antenatal care or uh, deliveries or anything of course the government hospitals were all open Yeah. and there were very few corporate hospitals who were just learning because it was a new pandemic we didn't know what to be doing everything was new for us and uh, we were making some labor barriers and so many other things so we found that everyone was knocking at our doors and then we were getting flooded with patients and we didn't really know because how many were taking becoming positive we converted two our of our operating theaters into negative pressures because the anesthetists were particular that we change and our anesthetists with the hardest people to handle because the moment we take cesarean like they will go hit the roof and then it was like a real war every day with the anesthetist so patients were like shunted here there everywhere there were a lot of patients who were on a foot will moving on to the uh, government hospitals and i remember the iog director called me and said my pgs are all getting positive can you please handle some of the load and it was real nightmare the first wave but the second wave what we found is everybody was slowly getting to learn how to handle this and uh, we were managing things better but the mortality and morbidity was getting higher during the second wave okay. so that was really very hard to handle and we found that uh, we do do we didn't lose uh, in the first wave in the second wave we had a couple of mortalities and government hospitals were having enough mortalities uh, especially pregnant women and they were having mortalities after a particular period so it was a big challenge antenatal care became video based where we were doing la- uh, video calls with patients for antenatal visits and uh, the distancing and so many other things it was a huge huge challenge i agree with you that pregnant women were jostled here and there and everywhere and they were finding it really tough to deliver during the especially during the first and more so uh, a little bit in the second wave right so it, it was a very difficult time for uh, many people and the vulnerable population like pregnant women it must have been worse let, let me just change track a little bit and come back to uh, ms shobha uh, we we know that working women earn good money nowadays but when it comes to finances and uh financial management i think there is a lot left uh, uh, i mean to be desired because we don't know how to manage our finances and especially during a pandemic like this uh, i think uh, it was imperative especially when people went through so much of financial losses uh, salaries were cut people lost their jobs and uh, managing finances from what you already have can be a challenge 
so where do you see a woman i mean what, what is a woman's role in all of this the financial part of it uh would you please un- yeah yeah thank you dr neeta i think um, the first observation that i would like to make is that going into the pandemic in january 2020 the m- most disadvantaged groups including women emerged even more disadvantaged nearly 2 years later so uh, at a societal level we all intuitively understand and you all being frontline workers will know this more than i do that women uh, are a disproportionate part of the frontline workers um so they have been impacted financially health uh, the all the emotional well being and the mental well being that uh, uh, our doctors spoke about um and just as companies require and hospitals require good financial uh, balance sheets households need too um that said the emerging research that i've seen as a journalist who uh, follow who tracks gender is that um women are it doesn't mean that women are not good in finances particularly if you look at the microfinance sector because uh, the microfinance revolution has shown more than anything that women are deemed more credit worthy um than their and i'm saying this as a fact and not as an opinion than their drunkard husbands uh, east of the bosphorus when you come to the lower in uh, socio economic strata uh, all the uh, uh, microfinance companies are prefer lending to women because they are seen as far better custodians of household wealth than the men so that that's one data point is that women including me we all some women think that we are not good at finances some of us don't have uh, have a belief which i do uh, as a writer definitely that we are not numerical uh, spreadsheets are uh, overwhelming we cannot deal with numbers but that said that the data doesn't prove that data shows that women in middle income households poorer in, uh, households and uh, upper upper households it's not a genetic thing <laughs> so uh, <laughs> uh financial uh, so what's the way forward okay so if we say that women are capable of managing their own finances and for some of us covid has thrust on us this uh, responsibility of managing our household finances because either our spouses or our children who used to do it for us have become too busy or our accountant has decided to go back mine went back to shivamogga and said i am at my native place internet is spotty so you have to pay your gst on time so these things have been thrust on us and we've had to cope but the great thing is that women are adept at coping we have been coping all our life we are adept at dancing to different tunes we are very adaptable that's a fantastic thing uh, for uh, for any human and so financial hygiene is something that we all need to learn just like public hygiene just like medical hygiene uh, we just need to own it that we we need to stop the voices in our head that say you know the man has to take care of the household yeah. money or our fathers will take care of it for us we can do it and we should very well said so uh, financial hygiene i like that word and uh, i i think that should become uh, um, the mantra for all women who are not doing it as yet so financial stress is uh, an important source of stress but uh, from here let me go to the other stresses that are there and during this pandemic there were huge stresses apart from the financial stress so did this affect uh, the relationship between partners the husband and the wife because uh as they say familiarity breeds contempt we are so used to our space we meet in the morning and then we meet in the evening and then if we are there all the time together did that really lead to increased rates of divorce like we read in some jokes and some uh, you know in the social media and things like that is that true the question is for me yes yes dr vasanta yeah yeah that's true marathi described the Uh, surfaced rather i would not say it wasn't there early on the first uh when you um, the thing uh, is in fact we jokingly say uh, marriage is strong when the couple is able to spend uh, time in the same room uh, the, the time the time they spend in the room without quarreling with, uh, with each other you know 
or without getting into an argument with each other. So if a couple is able to do that for a prolonged period of time, then of course the marriage is strong. So coming down to, we look at marriage from different aspects, but the cornerstone of any marriage is the relationship. Okay, it doesn't matter to which profession each person belong, and the, uh, the partners belong, but ultimately it comes down to a relationship. And in, its, in a relationship, it's how much you give in and how much you take. Generally, when people get married, they look at the positive points in the partner and then they get married or the family decides to get them married, whatever. But I think finally, it is uh, the continuance of a marriage depends upon how much you can accept the negative aspects of the other person. That determines how stable the marriage is. Okay? This is in general about that. Now, As I said, any disaster, any calamity, depression or economic depression or anything, it always hits a woman heart, okay? And uh, yes, marital discord did think because the partners were together in the house and all other support systems were not there. Earlier, the domestic work used to be get done by some help. The woman can now and then can go to a parent's home or could meet her friends. So some kind of buffer was there. So even if there were a lot of negative issues, a lot of fissures in the marriage, there were buffers, there were social support systems which kept the marriage going. That apart, we also found that people who had a bad marriage even before the pandemic, it just got accentuated after the pandemic. When people had a good relationship, the pandemic didn't matter. And there were um, some of my clients who would want the husband to spend more time at home but because of his work or because of the traveling, he had less time. But they had a good relationship. Actually, those women were happy during the lockdown because the husband was there all the time. But that's because they already had a good relationship. And when men take to alcohol, especially during this difficult period, it again uh, strains the relationship. The most important thing here is how sensitive are you to the needs of the woman? There were some well-employed men who were holding high jobs, you know. But they said, I provide everything. There's a fridge, there's a washing machine, I give her everything. I, but there, all kinds of um, social communication was lost at that time. So, you know, she's alone. She needs somebody to share, you know. That emotional need was absent in many men. That caused, again, a lot of disruption in the marital life. So I think uh, men instead of just providing all the needs, they also need to understand that they have to be a companion to the woman, understand her, also give importance to her needs. And uh, women generally are suppressed, you know, when they voice these concerns, the parents would say, no, no, come on, he's given everything, he's not drinking, he's not going about other men, so why are you complaining? So they even feel bad to express this as a complaint. But the strength of the relationship always depends upon how much each of them understand, you know, that understanding, that uh, need to serve the other person, need to understand the person, need to be sensitive to what she wants, you know, which only you can provide. I think that is very important in a marriage. That thing got strained during the pandemic. It highlighted whatever marital differences they had. This happened right across uh, the entire spectrum of women, working women, uh, women at home. Housewives had to do more work. And that was another thing. Working with, they had to do their work and they also had to do other things. And some of the men relocated to their native place, you know, because uh, especially the IT folks, they could work from home. Sometimes women also were working from home. And they found it very difficult because, you know, how many in-laws are very understanding of the daughters in law. So it actually aggravated their problems. They were just to come back to Chennai to start their work from office. You know, so of them are very happy now that they are relocated, right? So I think it's many factors. The buffers were removed and uh, the gender differences got highlighted and the lack of sensitivity as far as men are concerned with respect to their wife's emotional needs. I think these were the major contributing factors and the already existing marital discord just got more pronounced. So you heard more stories about this. Right. So pre-existing cracks became more glaring. And uh, that's what I think we all uh, uh, read about. In the same way, in, uh, Dr. Usha, in our field of diabetology, we have had several papers published 
uh, which talk about gender disparity when it comes to care of diabetic women. So uh, they, they, they receive less care probably because of uh, themselves being neglectful uh, or the family neglecting them uh, like a secondary status or something like that in the uh, in some classes so do you see did you see that during this pandemic did women suffer in general with respect to medical care uh, i i think to a large extent yes because there was a little prioritization even in the outpatient departments as to who we were seeing so the mm -hmm. mundane routines like took a backstage and uh, i think there were uh, patients of course, I think uh, the gestational diabetes has really risen so high that every fifth bed that I do rounds is happening to be a diabetic or sometimes even every third bed. And they are all in their 20s. And some of them are with uh, increased BMI. Some of them are not with an increased BMI, but still having gestational diabetes. And that is as far as pregnant women are concerned. But those who are in their midlife, their diabetic status and how they were taking care of. I think it all took a great toss because they were busy doing so many other things like Dr. Vasanta said, washing the vegetables. I think there was so much hype as to washing them, keeping them out, drying, so many other things. So, so a lot of additional things that actually came up. And we weren't actually seeing these patients at all during the first or second wave. We were not having any gynec patients. We were seeing only the antenatal patients and even the medicine department wasn't seeing all these patients as a routine. So I think the care and whatever they had to get during that period, actually, I think they were in getting and they were also not coming forward because uh, there was other priorities that they had and they felt okay unless otherwise they have some neuropathy or something that's really bothering them or they have recurrent UTI or something that's really making them come over. Small little things, I think they were just look overlooking. Oh I, I think it's very true. Right, right. Okay. Uh, uh, let me come back to uh, Ms. Shroma. Um, we are all social animals and women more so, I think. So we need to talk all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, physical interaction socially was at its lowest during this pandemic. And I think that led to a huge increase in social media engagement. In fact, I had obesity patients and we asked the questions on screen time and we had patients uh, who were on the screen for six hours and seven hours in a day. That, and that's not exaggerating. So this huge uh, engagement with social media, do you think it has got some repercussions for the future? And do you think it is here to stay and it's, it's going to affect us adversely? So, and how? So please call me Shobha. Um, okay. <laughs> um, so there are two uh, things, and I'm sure many of you have seen this. Um, there is a book called Alone Together, which was written by a woman, a professor at Harvard, I, if I remember right. It basically talks about how today's youngsters will sit in a cafe yeah. and they will be texting each other next to each other. Yes. <laughs> and uh, we're all alone together. Uh, we do that at home. I mean, my husband and I will be reading on our iPads and then we will share uh, texts from our children. So. Um, we are alone together. But the more recent book, which is written by somebody in Dr. Vasanta's field, is a gentleman psychiatrist from the University of Heidelberg. It's called In Defense of a Human Being. It's by Dr. Thomas Fuchs. And he talks, he uses word that, words that are in my realm. He talks about presence and embodiment and how we humans are the only species. We like touch. We like the resonances that come in physical presences of being with each other about how touch and resistance are how we make sense of our reality. And we can't touch and resist. Or the, the touch and resistance does not happen on our online uh, media. Yeah. So uh, I think after COVID, there will be a yearning for people to get back to the physical spaces. There will be a yearning for us to congregate together because we are a social animal. We are a community. We like being around. Even those of us who say we are introverts, I think... Uh, what differentiates uh, the mammals is our desire for community. 
So I am hoping that we will come back and go back next time we can meet <laughs> physically instead of virtually. Sure, sure. Um, but the cautionary tale comes again from social media. There is a documentary which I'm sure many of you have seen called The uh, Social Dilemma. It is uh, uh, free on YouTube and Netflix. Everybody should watch it because it was made by people who invented the like button on Facebook, who the tech geeks in Silicon Valley who created YouTube. And it shows young girls who are cutting themselves because uh, on the wrist in the bathroom by themselves, it's a very cautionary tale of how we have caught up in this narcissistic culture where we measure our self-worth by how many likes we get, how many, um, it's, uh, it's horrible. And I see it in high school students in Bangalore, as I'm sure all of you know better than me, because you see it in your practices. Um, social media is a, catching a tiger by the tail. Um, for my mother who is 85, it is a way of connecting with her sister-in-law in America, um, but she turns it off. She doesn't, she spends two hours on it. I spend, I put screen uh, time, I love my iPhone. I spend so much time on it. I have to, as a writer, I use, I use apps called Rescue Time, Freedom, uh, to figure out that, stop myself from surfing the web, so uh, social media is you're catching a tiger by the tail. And I think each of us has to come up with how to get out of that dopamine hit that we all get. Um, and uh, I find one thing, though, personally, I find that when I'm in, in the company of people, I don't check my phone as much. So I've just decided that hereafter, instead of saying, hey, let's catch up over a phone call, I'll say, let's walk in Kaban Park. Let's go to Lal Bagh and take a walk. Physical meetings help. And all of us should figure out ways of getting out of our smartphones, getting out of our iPads, because social media is a slippery slope. Uh, evolutionarily, the brain has not figured out how to deal with it. Right. And as far as I'm concerned, the jury is still out about whether it's good for us. So yeah. my goal in 2022 is to reduce my social media usage. Social media usage. <laughs> yeah, and now uh, I'm told that uh, these youngsters have a new... Uh, you know, uh, lingo. They call it FOMO, fear of missing out. And that's the reason they're all the time because they, they don't want to miss out a single post, a single like, and uh, that has led to, I think, uh, this kind of an engagement. So that, that actually brings me to my next question to Dr. Vasanta, and that is uh, this kind of uh, social engagement with uh, social media <clears throat> has, uh, and plus the pandemic together, how has it changed family dynamics? On the one hand, everyone was at home. And on the other hand, they're all doing this to connect with the outside world. So how has it actually changed the family dynamics? Has it changed for the better, for the worse, or there are mixed reviews about this? I would say, uh, I think people were there under the same roof. They were not living. They were just merely existing. They were in their own worlds, you know. And uh, see, after, uh, like for instance, if it's a uh, husband, the male member of the family, he is work prolonged working hours, working from home. After that, he has no energy or uh, inclination to talk with anybody or even look after the child. So the easiest thing that he does is uh, get on to the gadget, okay? And then uh, some messages and what. Yes, women also got addicted to social media. I know there are women who even when they want washing the vessels, they are housewives. You know, they want the uh, WhatsApp on and all that stuff. And of course, for children, it was very bad. You know, because the parent, if the child is around, uh, say, 14 years or something, the parent has some of the work, cannot sit by the child. So the parent is assuming that the child is on an online class, but the child is doing something else. Okay, we got them introduced into this kind of social media. So it was very bad. And uh, as I said, the relationships soured a great deal. Because at least earlier, they would go out for a dinner or for a weekend, they would go to some other place. Now, all those avenues were cut off. So since people were already habituated to using the cell phones, this just increased manifold. And the other reason why people search the net, you know, even with respect to COVID infection, people think that they can gain information by surfing the net, gain information about things they don't know. And since there was this unpredictability factor, people not knowing how the COVID infection was taking place. So that was the reason they were searching the net. 
And our people have this habit of indiscriminate usage. They don't go for the purpose. Like you and I, when we want to stuff in it, we have a purpose for that. We know what you're looking for. Here, you know, when you see one thing, then another thing comes. And of course, your uh, uh, the thing because of the artificial intelligence, that uh, particular net uh, knows what you're going to make, look for next. So you get all those things popping up. So finally, people get uh, diverted into something else. The, uh, the women again suffered because the woman always has an emotional need to communicate. Uh, we always say that social communication is a vitamin for men. Okay, just like how we pop up vitamin pills for a better physical health, whereas social communication is important for mental health for everybody. Uh, women have their own ways of seeking social communication. You know, they talk to their friends and whatnot. But for the woman, it is more important, especially the woman has a need to talk to the husband. She wants to know, she wants to know how the food was, or simple things, you know. But, uh, you know, all these things were missed. And their own communication, they could not meet in the park or they didn't have their own girl, uh, all women groups and all that to share information like that. And there was too much workload. That was another thing. And when there is work, women always put her needs last. Okay. So, again, because the sense of responsibility is always more, you know, okay, and for the family, for the children, right? So, generally, she never thought about her own emotional needs until it all pent up in, like, you know, how when you have too much water in a dam, and then it bursted, and then they came down with an emotional breakdown. In the case of working women, it was difficult. Though they had their work, they did, some of them did say that the work was actually... Uh, a welcome thing because they at least they were away for some time, away from what they saw. But then again, they have to come back, you know, to do all the rest of the work. They're worried about the children. I think here it is a matter of shared responsibility. All right, when it's your child, I think the men should also chip in, or even whatever domestic they get, they should chip in in some manner. Right. So I think that was missing. So that again caused a lot of problem to the women. And dynamics actually changed for the worse, whether in the case. Yes, they did. Yeah. And apart, I think apart from all of that, the, the dynamics changed. And apart from the social media thing and all that, in general, I think sedentariness increased because there's no way of going out to exercise and all of that. And uh, we did see a spike in a lot of lifestyle disorders. So my question to Usha in the same vein is that uh, obesity increased. Obviously, there are many papers which actually... Uh, corroborate that evidence that's saying that uh, obesity increased. So uh, we know that women have some unique disorders associated with their sex and uh, PCOS is one of those. And we know that obesity makes PCOS worse. So post pandemic, did you actually see a spike in PCOS uh, severity or incidence? Uh, not really. Uh, actually PCOS per se, I think it's really getting overdiagnosed. I, I think uh, the criteria for diagnosing of PCOS is now in the patient's hands. They have Googled enough and ultrasound says some few peripherally uh, uh, placed follicles and they all say when they come to us, they say, I have PCOS doctor, can you do something for me? So it's not the complaint that they have. And we do have 15% of uh, thin PCOS, but yeah. uh, to answer your question, we haven't seen a surge in the number of PCOS, but obesity, yes. We don't find young girls who are less than 60, 65 kgs at all. That's all history. And uh, it's now plus double XL, triple, I don't know how many XLs will go into their clothes and sizes, but they are very cool about it. I'm, I'm really sorry to say that because, uh, but to find a PCOS contributing, they do have menstrual disorders. They have, uh, all, I mean, irregular cycles, they have infrequent cycles, they have spotting, they have all kinds of menstrual disorders, but PCOS per se to be diagnosing, we haven't really seen a surge post pandemic. Right, right. Okay, so th this were, these are problems, I think more of adolescent girls and young women, but coming to the girl child Shoba, uh, we have so many policies in place and we have a lot of emphasis on the education of the girl child. Uh, and I think all those, uh, you know, 
uh, well laid plans uh, must have really uh, gone for a toss because uh, of the pandemic and again the you know uh, with the best of intentions the girl child was she really compromised do you have you read i mean i'm sure you know about all of this uh, did it really take a hit so i back to school might be a difficult task yeah yeah so uh, dr neeta so let me tell you the bad news and the good news the <laughs> good news is that dr rukmani banerjee who desi- who designed the acer reports the state of education reports uh, this year has won uh the yidan prize which is the world's highest education prize uh, it carries an award of uh, 4 million dollars uh, it is wow. split between two people so this lady uh who has spent her lifetime in education has uh this year won the uh, top uh, sort of the nobel of education okay. and uh, i have been tracking her and one of the things she says is that they have decided to focus on reading because even to understand a math problem you need to learn how to read in order to understand mm-hmm. and women girl children um again this is uh, falls in the nebulous area where it's not true science uh, girl children are generally supposed to be better at reading so we have that going for us so uh, as far as the girl child goes in terms of education genetic predisposition is linked to success as you as you all know better than me um and today's uh, governments uh not just in india but all over the world are designed to help girl children that said covid has affected both girls and boys because you know my neighbor's son who is eight uh, i heard him he came here home to study because his mom was sick and she he said miss i really love this class but i wish we had more breaks <laughs> so this <laughs> <laughs> this uh, chutku little thin little boy who wants to go out and bounce around and he's stuck in front of the cam uh, the computer and this is our ecosystem and in in rural india it is even worse so internet connectivity has set back uh, our rural children no doubt about it both girls and boys um so what is the best thing we can do for girl children buy them books buy all our children books because a uh, better authority than me dr banerji rukmini banerji who is now the uh, won the nobel for education has uh, has emphasized reading um and every september 5th which is a month ago we uh, celebrate uh, sarvapalli radha krishnan's birthday as uh, teachers day and the guru purnima in the month of ashada so india reveres gurus india reveres its teachers and education has seen uh, is all of us think that's the way forward so yes dr neeta girl children have taken a setback but i think in this area all children have taken a setback and i think that if uh, uh, an eminent person like dr banerji has anything to do with it uh, reading will help our girls and we should all buy uh, our uh, the girl ngos that we are involved with books and uh, that's the least we can do absolutely absolutely very well said so that, that that actually brings me to another problem that women face uh otherwise also and that is domestic violence and um i'm sure that during the pandemic uh women have been the uh, subject of domestic violence ever more so so dr vasanta what has been your experience in this uh, regard has it increased yeah yes it has increased because when the marital discord uh, increases it is also part of that uh, yeah. Yeah, isn't it and if you look at domestic violence it's not just confined to our culture or indian subcontinent or just the developing nations even uh, you do have that you do have that even in the western nations but in a different context okay and uh, any calamity any psychosocial uh stress or or any um, major disaster does cause a uh, spike in domestic violence they saw that with respect to hurricane katri in uh, the other day domestic violence peaked at that now why is domestic violence occurring at all you know in household well one is i think it's not just the disaster or the pandemic which is precipitating it it's not just the only cause i think it's what the boys grow up to see in their parents if they have grown up in a household where the father is constantly abusing the mother 
and uh, the mother is looked down upon, the mother is not given the due respect. This kind of child will always develop the same attitude when he gets married. Okay, that kind of male superiority. The other thing is, men are more prone to um, aggression because of the testosterone, because of the increased muscle power and all that. They are likely to become impulsive. That is seen always. Then the other thing is, under stress, a man reacts in a different manner and a woman reacts in a different manner. A man reacts with aggressive behavior, impulsive behavior. His uh, emotionality or the stress that he's undergoing is directed outward. And the easiest object is the woman at home, the wife, you know. So that is why you always find the people saying, oh, I'm under a lot of stress at work. Uh, I'm uh, spending 16 hours at work. I don't have the patience, you know, irritability. Now, this is also an accepted norm in the society. They say, oh, he's under a lot of stress at work. That is why he's getting irritable. So that is why he, uh, he's eating the wife. And so you are just, don't provoke, you know. So that is a thing. But the woman, when she's under stress, doesn't react with aggression most often. Uh, by and large, the woman becomes emotional. She either develops anxiety, she develops depression and things like that. Now, these emotions are directed inward. She's suffering, right? She doesn't uh, project it onto somebody else. So that is the clear difference between the way a man reacts to stress and the woman reacts to stress. And of course, if the man suffers from alcoholism, it just compounds the problem. And the problem with men also, especially people are used to taking alcohol, the tendency to take alcohol increased during the pandemic because their other social outlets were not there. You know, they were not going out and the easiest thing was to reach for the bottle. So when they are uh, abusing alcohol, domestic violence increases manifold. And this was more seen in the lowest strata. Though they didn't have money for food and all, still the men managed to find uh, money to drink and uh, women. Earlier, women were not complaining that much, but now they're coming, you know, it's, uh, people are speaking about it. Okay, and they did uh, not in front of the husband, but at least in the privacy of the consultation room. Uh, you know, because they don't want to be beaten and things like that. You know, it's um, uh, when you get uh, when you get beaten up, your self-respect is lost. So at least women are now standing up. So all these things are coming to the fore. Not that it wasn't there earlier. But yes, whenever there is a widespread uh, problems in the community and there is stress in the man, he definitely reacts with anger. And the woman is at the receiving end. Domestic violence did increase. It did increase even in very uh, uh, educated families and things like that. And uh, earlier, at least, there was some outlet for the woman. And poor thing, she never had that during the pandemic. Where she could she go to her mother's place, it was far away, or things like that. So all those issues uh, increased domestic violence. And in some cases, it even uh, women decided to go for uh, terminating the marriage. You know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Dr. Vasanta, as you very rightly said, we've all seen that uh, there was no money for food sometimes, but this always managed to find alcohol. So that is what we saw. So uh, since nutrition and nutritious food for the family took a big hit during the pandemic because first of the lockdown and then for the financial issues, uh, did we see a surge of nutritional disorders, malnutrition, anemia, Dr. Usha, in a big way? Uh, during this period and after? Uh, anemia, of course, as far as women are concerned, uh, anemia it was is... always there, yeah. But then did, did the nutrition suffer even more? Because so uh, many things were not available, no yes. vegetables and things like that. Yes. Yeah. Yes, though we don't have the right numbers, I think uh, anemia was found in larger numbers because uh, it, it's... Basically, the nutrition, especially of women in midlife or women in pregnancy, uh, anemia did have a surge. And we found that out because we were having more of postpartum hemorrhage. And then we found that uh, their baseline hemoglobin is much less than what we used to. So definitely nutrition uh, took, a, I mean, pandemic took a hit at the nutrition. And of course, we were giving them the supplements and a lot of times they were not taking the supplements when they were pregnant. 
So for some reason, they weren't taking the supplement. Maybe they didn't have the money because the government used to have a free supply at that time. For some time during the COVID pandemic, the access to all those folic acid and everything else was a little bit uh, staggering. So that also uh, made a difference. I think you are right. Uh, though we don't have the right numbers and figures, mm -hmm. anemia did have a surge. Though we don't find malnutrition in adults per se, but I'm sure there is uh, associated deficiency of uh, proteins, which we normally find with anemia. Mm -hmm. So, so as is actually seen in society, I think the divide became even greater. Like in usual times, the affluent people become obese. This became more pronounced. And uh, the lower classes who are malnourished became more anemic and, uh, you know, mal uh, victims of malnutrition. So the divide, I think, became broadened during the uh, yes. pandemic. Uh, that is what I see. Uh, I would like to come back to uh, Shova because we have talked about so many things that have really gone wrong. Things did go wrong during the pandemic. But I'm sure that uh, some good things came out of this. For example, women learned that they can actually live without shopping. Uh, you could actually do with much less and you can live frugally. So, uh, and we had time to look inwards. So uh, did the pandemic actually have some good outcomes also yes. socially? Yes, that's a terrific question. Um, you know, I'm a journalist, I ask questions. So one thing that I've done on an informal basis all through the year is whenever we friends meet up either on Zoom or while taking a walk, um, I ask this question, what is your COVID takeaway? And uh, if you are close friends, they open up. If they are uh, not so close, they'll say, oh, I want to go. I want to travel to Dandeli after COVID. I want to go to Morocco after COVID. So usually it becomes about, I'm going to buy that uh, Range Rover after COVID. So usually it becomes that. But a lot of people, the if I have a common thread, it is the, uh, you know, there was this book called Man's Search for Meaning. Um, Victor I, yes. So I think a lot of people during COVID, like you said, have had to look inwards. We've dis discovered that we can do with a lot less and frugality has become a virtue. So COVID has changed our notions of what we think of as luxury. In the past, luxury used to be buying objects, but COVID has also not changed our uh, notions of luxury in one way, because why do we buy that whatever car or whatever uh, sari or whatever brand name that we want to own is because of its signaling value. Now, COVID has said you don't need to show off, but now the signaling value, at least amongst the younger generation of our kids. And if I ask a 20 year old uh, college student in Mount Carmel, she will say, auntie, I'm going to buy, I'm going to go vegan. I'm going to buy unleather handbags. I'm going to do fair trade, carbon neutral, last mile traceable, no child labor, not animal tested products from cooperatives which work in tribal wow. villages. You know, so their notion, their signaling value is very different from ours. It has entirely to do with climate change, entirely to do with sustainability. So I think uh, you're right in that COVID has forced us to look inward. And I think in this particular area, we should take a page from the, the coming generations because clearly they've thought about it. And Dr. Krishna has said he's going to start a bark and leaf clothing line. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So they are thinking about work-life balance, unlike us. They are thinking about sustainability and climate change, unlike us. And they are. They have decided that they will. Uh, today's twenty millennials, that twenty-year-olds and younger, they have decided they don't need the brand names. So, in that way, COVID has forced us to be frugal. It has forced us to look inwards about what is meaningful to us. And each of us has to come up with that answer. I have, but each of us, sure. our answers will be different. Our own meaning for life. Each one has to search for that. Yeah, yes, yeah, uh, that, yeah. that's so so very true. And uh, Dr. Vasanta, I I think your uh, profession is quite fascinating because you uh, come across so many stories uh, from which we all can learn actually. And uh, the the one notion is that women are far more resilient than men. So, do you have any examples of this particular resilience in women during this pandemic? Yes, by and large, uh, women actually uh, are more motivated when something 
goes wrong, they want to find a solution, unlike the man who most women escape is. So here again, uh, see, even before the pandemic, if there's a child who's mentally retarded or has a learning disability, or a child who's going astray, most often it will be the mother who brings the child, right? Not the father. Father, in fact, might say, no, 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 he's okay, okay. But the mother wants a solution. So though they are emotional, they, they have the emotional pain, right? After the emotional pain, they seek a solution and they don't mind seeking answers. Whereas a man, if there is a problem, the tendency for him is, it's, it is a, it is, if he has to narrate his problems to somebody, he thinks it's a sign of his weakness. So invariably they bottle it up, you know, or they don't seek a solution. And moreover, for them, it is only uh, a way of showing their aggression towards others. So when you show aggression towards others, only the victim has to seek a solution, not the perpetrator. All right. So because uh, being emotional, I do understand, puts a woman at a disadvantage with respect to developing emotional problems. But again, the same emotionality also gets driven to for her to find a solution to the problem. That is why you find women more resilient with psychosocial problems. She handles different relationships. You find, uh, see, when a woman gets married, gets into the marital home. She has to handle the husband, the relatives who walk in, and the in-laws and all that, and the children too. And manages the finances. Like as Ms. Shobha said, it's not that the women are less financially prudent. They do manage within the income of the husband. They do it beautifully. In fact, when uh, many of the marital women come with depression, anxiety, and they're very upset because the husband doesn't spend time with them. And I tell the husband, so you're able to work in the office, put in so many hours, 14 hours, 16 hours. It's because a woman manages the household. She's a CEO of the house. Do respect her for what she's doing. In fact, I think all new companies must even recognize that role. Yeah. So, yes, and uh, uh, women had to share the burden of looking after the family and the caregiver, being a caregiver to the COVID patient, you know, men got affected more than women, right? Because they were going out and coming and they had to manage the financial resources. So generally itself, you find women more resilient. That's because by nature, they want to do something. They want to change. It. They want to really find a solution. They don't mind sharing it with somebody. Men don't share. They don't uh, generally ask somebody. And sometimes they seek uh, solace and by taking alcohol and things like that. So by nature, they are like that. And uh, during COVID, yes, some women lost their husbands to COVID. And uh, some of them were out of the uh, IT workforce. I know now a girl was again retraining herself to join her IT work. And one company was even considerate enough in accommodating her. So she's learning the new technologies. And in fact, when she came to me for uh, treatment, uh, initially it would be for grief reaction. That's what I expected. She said, doctor, I've got to know that. I have, uh, I know it's over. I know cold has taken away. But tell me how I should face the world. Uh, because I, it's different. Can I dress the way like the way I dressed before? Or will people look differently at me? So now she's thinking about coping. That was a very, that was a remarkable thing. You know, how will people view at me? Can I d disclose to others that I've lost my respect? You know, so she was thinking about moving ahead. And uh, there was another lady who was uh, seeking a job. She didn't get a job as yet. She lost her husband to a heart attack during the COVID, but nothing related to COVID. But you know, her jobs are hard to come by. So she's attending some coaching classes to uh, upskill herself so that she's employment ready and her family is supportive. But she says, my family can support me, my parents can support me, but they are getting old. I have to stand on my feet and I have to provide education for my child. So all these are factors to show that uh, despite their emotional problems, although women are considered emotionally weak, they can still uh, uh, rise up to the occasion. So, so these stories of resilience are really very uh, inspiring to all of us, uh, whatever be their profession or uh, whatever uh, be their uh, social strata or uh, financial strata. Coming back to a medical uh, issue, Dr. Usha, we uh, have seen in diabetes at least that um, a lot of uh, patients because of the pandemic could not be detected early or did not get the follow-up that they deserved. Uh, 
uh, because of the pandemic. So non-communicable diseases like this, have you seen in your uh, practice that uh, they've been hit badly because of not being detected early, for example, and uh, then, you know, gone on to get more serious disease? One thing that I have to really uh, say that we were really concerned is we know with the rise in diabetes and hypertension and obesity in women, we are seeing a large surge in the number of uh, patients with endometrial cancer, which we never used to see before. The standard teaching was always that uh, carcinoma of the cervix is the commonest cancer in women. Uh, now things were changing and in the last decade or so with all these triad of obesity, diabetes and hypertension, we are seeing a, a significant number of endometrial cancers. So these women who had either heavy menstrual bleeding or abnormal uterine bleeding, or had probably early hyperplasia of the endometrium where there is a thickening, they were in coming to the hospitals. So uh, these kind of possible malignancies, which are early, we were in doing pap smears like the way we are doing. Uh, we used to do screen all women for pap smears. So all those we were seeing in large numbers. Uh, I think they did not come to hospital because of the COVID pandemic. And it was really sad that even if we encouraged them to come, uh, they weren't coming because they were worried they'll pick COVID. And so they were just popping medicines across the counter from pharmacies. And uh, we used to see so many of them with postmenopausal bleeding or uh, hyperplasia who did not take treatment and coming after an entire year with uh, carcinoma. So that is one thing that I found. The second is, all heavy menstrual bleeding. They were all on their own medication from the pharmacies. And they were taking hormone tablets left, right and center because the pharmacists were just giving them OCPs or progesterones or whatever. And they used to take irregularly. So they had all kinds of problems. So these are the two things that we really felt sad, but then uh, that was a problem for most of these women. Yeah, so non-COVID problems were uh, were really compromised and were not looked at as they should be. But I suppose no one is to blame here. The situation yes. uh, was really, really bad. So uh, now uh, I want to ask one final question to each and you can be really elaborate with your answers. We do have the time. And let me go first with uh, Shobha. Uh, going forward, all the uh, uh, damage that the pandemic has wreaked upon us uh, what do you see or what do you think the remedial measures should be as a roadmap, uh, if you will, uh, on cultural, domestic and social fronts? Uh, what do you think we should be doing? Hmm. So I think this is a very important question. I will take it part by part. Um, as a lover of languages, the word culture comes from cultivate. Uh, which is cultivate in a very physical sense, the land that we all come from and the cultivation of the mind. Yeah. So I think the pandemic has taught us that we are rooted to our land. We are rooted to the place that we have chosen either as our home or um, where we decide to live. So I think culture wise, I think it behooves us, each one of us to figure out who we are. I think introspection, like you pointed out, Dr. Nita, is a happy side effect of the pandemic, because we are stuck at home, we are introspecting. Do I really need to buy that thing? Do I really need to spend that much money? So um, one way to introspect is to figure out our culture. And uh, by that, I mean, what do you want? How do you want to spend the next half of your life? How, do you, what, how now to make myself happy? How now to get meaning? How now to be purposeful? And uh, my own personal answer is uh, because I love nature is Vana Prastha, which is going more and more into nature. I'm a bird watcher. So that is, I have figured it out, but it could be different things for different people. Um, the, that is the culture. Figure out what you want to cultivate in your learnings, in your, uh, in your milieu, in your cultural milieu. Social is uh, more interesting. Um, one of the best books I have read is called Smart Money. How to Spend for Happiness. And it's written by Elizabeth Dunn. I would recommend it highly. Um, it talks about how you spend money in order to gain happiness. And I'm, I'm bringing it up for a very specific reason. All of us have seen 
the migrant workers returning in droves to their homeland. All of us are surrounded by people on the streets who have lost our jobs, people who are less fortunate. Well, it turns out that the sociologist, Elizabeth Dunn, who is at the University of British Columbia, she has uh, done scientific studies, much like the ones, the double blind ones that you all are used to. So this is not an opinion. This is a, a sort of studied. She says pro-social spend spending, by which she means spending on other people, altruistic spending actually increases your happiness. So if you have, uh, let's say 50,000 rupees, you can buy your Gucci bag or your Amaze scarf, or you can say, I'm going to use this money to help Ashwini Trust in my neighborhood where young poor girls come to learn Bharatanatya. So that is, and according to Dr. Dunn, this is a great way to spend money because the benefits will just keep coming back to you. You will feel happier as a result. So that's pro-social spending. The second aspect of social is, uh, has to do with treat yourself to experiences rather than objects. Um, take a vacation with friends. If possible, take a vacation with a group of people you like, because again, we are social animals um, rather than buying the car. Um, so time is our greatest luxury of all. Figure out how you want to spend your time and force yourself in the evening when you're tired and you come back from your clinics and you really just want to veg out in front of the TV, force yourself to go to that wedding with your aunt that you really don't like because you know what? You go there, you meet people and you get enlivened by it. So some of it is discipline. Then of course, the, uh, the other aspect of the social bit is uh, figuring out value systems, which all our children are doing. Like I said, that long litany answer I got about you know, carbon footprint and you know, no animal testing, you know, they have figured it out that they want to spend, they want to wield their money as a weapon and support brands that stand for what they stand for. So the great thing about the coming decade is there are two trends that are like juggernauts or Jagannath, which comes from Puri Jagannath. Um, one is sustainability slash climate change. The second for us, lucky for us, is women. I think gender is going to be huge in the coming years. Yesterday, I was on a panel with uh, Kiran Majumdar Shah, who runs uh, Biocon, and she was saying that DEI, diversity, equity, and in in inclusion is the byword for all hospitals, including and uh, corporates. In so Dr. Usha, I'm sure you've heard about that. So I think women the, as a, as a, as a, um, force um, will only increase similarly with environment. So social thing would be figure out where you want to spend your money, uh, stay on top of this whole environment bandwagon that is going to be the future for all of us and see if you want to spend money on brands that are sustainable. And the last one you talked about is domestic. Domestic is the closest for all of us. And for me, let me allow, be allowed to speak a little personally and how that has played out in my life is a renewed negotiation with my spouse about roles, about roles that have now suddenly become very fluid. And because both of us work from home, the roles that we have fallen into have suddenly, you know, both of us are sort of stuck and we are like, what do we do now? And so there is a renewed negotiation of, if my mother drops in or your mother drops in, you will sit with her or I will sit with her. Usually it is this wife who ends up playing that role, but now everything is up for grabs. So we negotiate with children, with spouses, and guess what? They sometimes enjoy it. <laughs> they sometimes enjoy being in the kitchen. They sometimes want, you know, they are, uh, they love the uh, accolades that come with playing roles, uh, um, that they are not hitherto unknown. <laughs> yeah, hitherto unknown. So it is, you know, the psychologist Marion Woodman, who is a Jungian psychologist who I love, she said patriarchy doesn't affect just women, it affects men too, because men too are pigeonholed into roles that they, they don't uh, get to express their feminine side. They don't get to express. Uh, my cousin, who is in New Jersey, said a very interesting thing. She said, Shobha, you, I have two sons and you have two daughters. You know what, if your daughter is a tomboy, nobody says anything. But if my son wants to paint his 
nails and he's five years old. He doesn't know any better. He's immediately, you know, uh, what's yeah. wrong with him. So boys too suffer from this uh, mental roles that we all have. And uh, COVID can be liberating. Why not we use this as an inflection point to change these uh, stereotypes and come out freer, all of us. Absolutely wonderful perspectives, Shobha. It was so very enlightening and a delight to uh, listen to your uh, different perspectives on the social cultural uh, fronts. So uh, I want to ask uh, Dr. Vasanta now uh, about uh, a final uh, lessons that we have learned, how women have you know, contributed to this pandemic in general. What are the takeaways basically? Yes, if you come across the domestic violence or the distress at home or the other problems faced by women or the community at large, if you look at it, you know, it is uh, because of the, uh, uh, because of we lacked certain uh, uh, people who could not help us. You now, starting right in the social, lower social strata, we didn't have the domestic help and see how much life crumbled at home. All right. And after the pandemic, when the even during the pandemic, when the lockdown was lifted, these women did take the risk to come and work in the houses. So what an important role they played in our lives. Next, okay, schools were closed, children were children. And oh, women get dominantly employed in the education system, sector as teachers. So how much teachers have helped us to keep the children at school for the most of their waking period? So that responsibility was lessened so we could get on with our lives. So what an important role teachers play. So again, that is predominantly populated by women. Then what about the health population, uh, health, health sector? 70% worldwide, 70% of the health force are, uh, is formed by women, all right? And here we had women working as nurses and doctors day in and day out, you know, going through the pains of the pandemic and sharing the responsibility. So if you look at the roles played by all these women, as either as domestic workers or as uh, domestic maids or as teachers or doctors, all these three professions were very important to us during this critical period. So we always talk great about women when they break the ceiling and they clear the IAS exam or something great, but we don't recognize these roles. I think these roles are very important for day-to-day -day living. I, and, they play, they, all these three roles play a pivotal, pivotal role in all our lives. It touches everybody. So it's high time we recognize these roles and give importance to them. Give them better working hours. Um, make sure that these people get uh, some recognition of their problems when they have a dual role or be sensitive to their needs and things like that. People are, you know, people think these roles are done because they don't have anything else to do. It's not true. They, they, they are taken for, the, they play these roles because, because they can do it better than others. I think even though it is a low paying job or things like that, you must recognize that important role and give respect to it. The society has to come forward to do that. Men at home may not generally, that's going to take several generations for men to change and respect their wives or whatever small job they're doing. And mind you, the small jobs are the ones which got lost. So uh, the family paid a heavy price and women paid a heavy price. So I think the society has to come forward to recognize these roles played by women during the pandemic. Uh, during the previous pandemic, that was during after the Spanish flu. After the Spanish flu, uh, black women were employed for the first time as nurses in the hospital. So that was a real uh, change, you know, where society accepted them that they can work as nurses in the hospital. So similarly, after the pandemic, I think we need to give importance to all these roles played by women and uh, respect them for what they do. And even now the vaccination program, predominantly it's a woman, right? You have the women going around in villages and calling people to get vaccinated. Right. This has to be recognized. Right. Yeah, very well said, very well said, uh, Dr. Vasanta. As a last question, uh, let me frame it like this. Uh, with due apologies, uh, uh, but with due respect to the men who are listening in on this, I do believe that women are the backbone of uh, society in general, in many ways. Having said that, and knowing that health is wealth, Dr. Usha, what would be your 
uh, a take home message for the girls and women in this respect to take care of their health and nutrition in taking this role forward uh, having handled women's health for the last 3 decades i feel so passionate when i see women who don't really take care of themselves they don't prioritize their own health they look at only what's wrong with my child what's wrong with my husband or my in-laws and other things and uh, it is across all strata of society it, i don't think educated uneducated and everything is really making a huge difference because i find this across all strata what there are certain things that i would really want to talk in this uh, we are seeing a surge in the number of medical termination of pregnancy uh, pregnancy we are seeing mtps in 13 year old girls 12 year old girls 14 year old girls and it's so sad uh, two months ago we had a 14 year old girl delivering a full term baby and she's feeding the baby and it's so heartbreaking to see this she herself is a little kid and she was so adamant she continued the pregnancy and she went on so these are so many things there are uh, societal pressures there are cultural pressures there are peer pressures and there are so many things that we are forced to handle and we cannot go beyond a particular limit and uh, the other thing that i find is screening for cancers we have so many camps we tell them you you can do self examination of the breasts come and do the pap smear there are so many things but women don't really wish to come over and i'm not saying they are ignorant many times they are aware of it but still they wouldn't want to come and do they will just procrastinate and say i will do it next month the month later and things like that i think we need to put an end to this women need to take care of themselves only then they can take care of the family that they can take care of and why is there such a rise in uh, diabetes and hypertension stress is something that we have to handle as women and it's not just the pandemic pandemic is probably the last straw that is actually on the camel's back so and diet is simply not being taken care of so many of these women are anemic and even the affordable ones are because they are very fond of skipping breakfast and you know the social media has different kinds of diets i don't know we never read those kind of diets in our medical books ever you have paleo you have some caveman's diet and so many other things and i see some of them having just chunks of chicken and nothing else and eggs boiled so all kinds of things and you know the most commonly visited guy is the orange shirt swiggy guy so he is there at every doorstep and he is like i don't know uh, the entire diet obesity everything and lack of exercise any time you tell them exercise oh i don't have time but they have time for everything else they don't want to make time even right. for pregnant women they will not want to make time for the exercise i think if they had if they made time for themselves and uh, spent time where they would love to do something that makes them happy why can't they spend i say spend one hour per day doing things that you love to do probably listen to music or chat with your friend or do whatever and these are the things they don't want to prioritize which i feel they should be doing make some time for themselves prioritize it will cut down on the stress you can take care of your family better and stay happy and healthy and that's what is a big mantra that all of us women need to think of thank you thank you uh, thank you so much and before signing off i would like to say i would like to quote actually from the same book that it just inspired me to do so uh, that shobha talked about man's search for uh, meaning in life uh, by viktor frankl where he did not write about the horrors of the holocaust that was not his intention his intention was to find out how some of them survived and why and that is why in the same way we need to celebrate the women and uh, other people who survived the pandemic not just after covid 19 but the crisis in itself and we have heard wonderful stories of such resilience and the way forward from our beautiful and wonderful panel that we have uh, over here and i must say they've done a fantastic job and uh, we've had a very good perspective of what has happened during the pandemic and what the way forward should be and we have to look at the silver lining and uh, move ahead and that again in the, uh, the words of viktor frankl is logotherapy don't look back just look ahead and that's what we're going to do and uh, with this i thank uh, dr krishna for this uh, opportunity to be amongst this 
wonderful people and heard some fantastic things. Thank you so much, and I hand it back to you. Uh, thank you, Nita. You know, uh, this is this is just uh, wonderful. You know, I listen to three women in my life all the time. But, uh, I spent the last uh, ninety minutes in rows listening to the four of you. So this is this is amazing stuff. Uh, and and importantly, you know, uh, as someone I mean, seventy percent of my practice is women. And I, I, I've spent the last one and a half years uh, trying to understand the kind of uh, stresses that they go through. What is going to be a challenge is, is, is while the pandemic is behind, the scars that it has left in most women is going to be what we have to learn to cope with when, when we start coming out, when, when you know, uh, kids leave home and the 75-year-old mom is suddenly alone back at home. So there are going to be new challenges and hopefully we can get you back to solve those for us. But it's been such a great perspective. Uh, uh, for those of them who have joined us live here on, on, the, on the YouTube channels, there are a lot more. And this gets uh, uh, accessed again and again. And I can tell you this, is, this has been wonderful. I learned so much. And, and, and uh, Mahesh, I'm sure you understood why I said some of my favorite people like that. I'll leave you to do the uh, vote of thanks. And again, thank you for your time. This is just being good. On uh, behalf of Wipro and GCCMC, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Nita, Dr. Vasanta, uh, Ms. Shobha, and uh, Dr. Usha for the uh, wonderful uh, you know, talk it was so engrossing and uh, I just didn't know how the time went by. Hearing my uh, perspective has also changed quite a bit. And uh, I am in a house where I'm the only male member and all are females. But uh, yes, uh, <laughs> when I get back, <laughs> when I get back, I will have a different you they will definitely see some more changes it has but this pandemic has definitely seen women playing a major role uh, they used to be the uh, we call the supreme court or home minister or whatever names people give but when the pandemic with everyone being at home they have adapted and they have held the entire brood together and saved many families through and uh, it's the strength of the lady which uh, takes the whole family through. And uh, with this, I'd like to thank uh, all of you all for sharing your insights. It was, uh, it was very nice. And this we wish you all a uh, happy evening. And uh, most of the people would be going back to the cricket match now, which <laughs> will start shortly. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.